Dr. Mahru. Uh, good, good, e good evening, everybody. Hope I am audible to all. Yeah. Yes, you are. Uh, so I'm Dr. Maharu Karwes, a resident doctor from pain and palliative care from Srinagar, Sheri Kashmir Institute of Medical Science. Uh, so my uh, case presentation is about a 42-year-old female who is a follow-up case of adenocarcinoma pancreas with liver and lung metastasis and peritoneal lymph adenopathy. Next slide, please. Uh, so the patient presented uh, with the chief complaints of altered levels of, levels of consciousness for one week. Uh, she had abdominal pain due to frequent massive ascites. Uh, she had loss of appetite, generalized weakness, and altered sleep pattern. And sometimes uh, there were uh, complaints of constipation as well. Next slide, please. Uh, history of present illness. Uh, the patient was a diagnosed case of adenocarcinoma pancreas with liver and lung metastasis in 2020 and after, uh, after frequent episodes of abdominal pain and vomiting. She had consulted a gastroenterologist in a private hospital where a biopsy was taken and adenocarcinoma of pancreatic or biliary origin was diagnosed. As it was a stage 4 disease and progressive, the patient was taken for six cycles of palliative chemotherapy in 2021. With the progression of disease, there were multiple episodes of hematemesis and frequent massive ascites. The patient wasn't hemodynamically stable, so the patient couldn't be taken for further treatment. And eventually, the patient was shifted to the pain and palliative care department in 2022 for end-of-life care. Uh, the patient was semi-conscious and was not responding much to commands, had loss of appetite, and wasn't eating at all. She had disturbed sleep and constipation as well. Next slide, please. Uh, on general examination, we found out the patient was emaciated, semi-conscious, disoriented. Uh, her temperature was 101 degree Fahrenheit, pulse was 80 beats per minute. Her blood pressure was 100 over 60 millimeters of mercury and the respiratory rate was 22 breaths per minute. On systemic examination per abdominally, we found her abdomen to be tense, tender and distended with inverted umbilicus. Uh, which was suggestive of massive ascites, but our other systems were within normal limits. Next slide, please. Uh, so some investigations were carried out in which the CBC was initially six grams per deciliter, but after uh, one unit transfusion, it was 8.7 grams per deciliter. Her total lymphocyte count was 10,200 and platelet was 84. Her serum creatinine was 2.9, sodium 136 and potassium 6 and her serum albumin was 2.5. So subsequently for uh, her uh, massive ascites, we used to do, we would do a frequent ascitic tap for the uh, drainage. And with that, we would intravenously administer human albumin 20% slowly. Since she was not eating at all initially, we started her on uh, total parental nutrition. And when the patient, patient started uh, responding and regained consciousness, we started her on oral feeds. Uh, then she was also uh, given diuretics and non-pharmacologically, uh, we would conduct frequent home visits for her along with the social worker for counseling. Next slide, please. Uh, psychosocial aspects. So uh, she's a 42-year-old homemaker and mother of two kids, daughter who is 11 years old and son 8 years old. Husband, a businessman, and himself a diagnosed case of carcinoma urinary bladder and currently not taking any treatment, he has been advised to undergo surgery but is reluctant as there is no one else to take care of the family. They are a family of four and the husband has to look after everything including the household work and kids and is, primary, and is the primary caregiver to his wife as well. All of this is further adding to the patient's suffering. Family income is also affected as the husband is not fully able to concentrate on his business. After regaining consciousness, the patient was worried about her children and the future as she's aware that there's no care to her disease. And at the same time, she's trying to convince her husband to get himself treated because she knows there won't be anybody else to look after the kids. Next slide, please. Uh, so after... Uh, 
her med IV medication, we shifted her to the tablets. Uh, so first of all, we gave her pantoprazole, one tablet before breakfast, set up Cypon so that uh, she had she had this loss of appetite so that she has appetite again and starts eating well. Uh, tab narcogen food, which is codeine and paracetamol, one tab two, twice daily. Tab dietol, which is a diuretic. Augmentin, uh, because she had uh, chest congestion, so we started her on Augmentin. Uh, Max Dalin NT uh, for generalized pain, neurological pain, and it has noradrenaline as well, so that it would aid in her sleeping properly. Velcolas, which is a bisocodile tablet, one, time bed, uh, one tablet bedtime for her constipation. Next slide, please. So the main concern here is that it's the terminal stage of cancer. There is recurrent massive ascites, altered levels of consciousness with disturbed sleep and lack of family support. Next slide, please. Uh, so the summary is a 42 year old female patient diagnosed as a case of adenocarcinoma pancreas with liver and lung metastasis who underwent eight cycles of palliative chemotherapy with recurrent massive ascites, pain abdomen and altered level of consciousness. So the discussions point, discussion points here are, is this patient ideal for end of life care? How to reduce her anxiety related to her children's future? And how can we provide support to the husband so that he can start with his own treatment? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mahru, for bringing such a nice uh, case for this session that's end of life care. So now I would like the participants to like unmute and ask if you have any question because there are a few questions which he has brought for discussion. The first question is, is this patient ideal for end of life care? So what do you think? What do you all think while hearing to this story? You can unmute and answer, otherwise you can put it out in the comments. Yes, okay, Shreya Shri says yes. Dr. Mahru, what do you think? Is this patient ideal for end of life care? Yes, I think this patient is ideal for end of life care because as we already know, this is a terminal stage of the disease. And right yeah. now the patient is herself aware that she may not have a long time to live. So yeah. I think this is the exact right time we can provide her with the support from palliative medicine so that she is at least content that even if she dies, her children uh, don't suffer because of her death her husband is getting adequately treated so, so that she at least, if not get more years to live, at least she'll die peacefully and, you know, a, a death with dignity. So that yes. she at least, you know, when she dies, she has that contentment in her that even if I'm dead uh, tomorrow, my children won't suffer. Everything will be just fine. So, so I think she's perfectly ideal for end of life care. Yes, definitely, because especially in a uh, patient with adenocarcinoma pancreas, what happens is that usually pancreatic cancer is something which uh, is a very late diagnosis. We are not able to detect it in the beginning. Most of the times it's like they have abdominal pain, they go to gastroenterologists, they consider it as gastritis, then so many other investigations they go through. And then when they finally land up, it is like terminal, like already the disease has spread somewhere uh, or otherwise the treatment is not going to give any uh, benefit. So that is how they come up. Most of the cases um, I have seen most commonly were in the stage four or in the advanced stage with metastasis. So obviously this patient needs um, is ideal for end of life care. Uh, so the other doctors, Dr. Manjari had mentioned, yeah, there seems to be no treatment. So um, there, uh, there is an option for palliative care. Then Harita says terminal stage with no treatment. We should address her worries for kids and husband and give a proper end of life care. And uh, okay, so yeah, uh, that's fine. I, I think Dr. Roop has joined. So we will stop this for now and then take it up at the end. Um, Shri Priya. It's ideal we have Dr. John as uh, our faculty for the evening. So for his formal introduction, I hand over it uh, to Dr. Ashwood. 
Good evening, everyone. So with immense pleasure, I would like to welcome the faculty for today, Dr. Roop Gursahani, who is a consultant neurologist and epileptologist as and a palliative care physician at, based at PD Hinduja National Hospital, Mumbai. Uh, he has his professional experience as a honorary associate professor in neurology at GMC and Sir JJ Hospital, Mumbai. He was a visiting fellow in epilepsy at Cleveland Clinic, USA. He has been a consultant neurologist at various other hospitals in Mumbai and also an associate professor and in charge of the Department of Neurology at TN Medical College and BYL Nair Hospital, Mumbai. He was the founder trustee of the Forum for Indian Neurology Education, which organizes teaching courses in neurology. And he is on the steering committee of ELICIT, the interdisciplinary task force of intensivists, palliative care physicians, and neurologists for end of life care in India. With immense pleasure, I would like to invite you, sir, for today's session and over to you, Dr. Roop. Um, thank you so much. It's it's always a pleasure to be speaking to uh, Palim India's students. And uh, I'm sorry, uh, I'll put on my camera towards the end, but uh, my laptop camera is defunct. So I'll have to switch over to the phone later. Uh, I'm going to, since I'm a little late and I'm really sorry about that, it was a long working day. I'm going to start my uh, presentation immediately. Uh, everybody can see my slides? Yes. So, <clears throat> uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Okay. Right, there we go. So, uh, I'm going to be talking to you about end of life care and uh, I'll try and give you a uh, overall perspective of uh, medical, legal, and ethical issues, put them all together so that uh, you have a complete view of what it is that the challenges that we face when we are managing patients in this kind of situation. Um, the first question is rather obvious. Uh, do we think about our own deaths? Do you think about your own death? And it's important because in uh, palliative care, uh, unless we are clear uh, in our thinking about uh, including emotions and so on about uh, death as a, as a whole, including how it applies to us and our loved ones, we may find it difficult to manage patients also. And for most of us, uh, if you think about your own death, the issue is of dying with pain and suffering. And Woody Allen, uh, an American uh, comedian, said it best. I'm not afraid of death. I just don't want to be there when it happens. Oh, sorry, skipped one slide. <laughs> By now, I'm sure you're aware that palliative care is applicable to all serious health-related suffering. And end-of-life and terminal care is a rather specific part of it. So if you talk of end-of-life care, it, uh, both of these are obviously applicable when it is certain that uh, uh, there is no treatment that is going to reverse the process. And eventually, it gets to the stage of actively dying, where physiological parameters show that the process is now has begun and will end in a short period of time. Uh, because these are these these are a little difficult to define. These are definitions that have been evolved by consensus, and you can't say that this has to be. This is a single definition. Nobody else will have any other definition. But the working one that we use for terminal illness is an illness from which recovery cannot be expected with the available treatment and death is considered to be unavoidable in the foreseeable future. Uh, while end of life care is an approach to a terminally ill patient that shifts the focus of care to symptom control, comfort, quality of life and quality of dying with support for the family. And at this stage, treatments aimed at cure and a prolongation of life can be stopped. Remember, or I hope you notice that neither of these has any mention of a timeline. And as you can understand, these are accurate actually in retrospect, because then you look back and say, okay, this is where it began. So one way of looking at this is in terms of trajectories. <clears throat> the disease trajectories of at the end of life were first spelled out in this paper way back in 2002. 
where they looked at uh, older Medicare decedents. Now, Medicare is a, a US government program which covers people beyond the age of 65. So it covers a fairly large proportion of the US population. And they what they did is they took, they randomly sampled deaths and kind of looked at what had happened to them. Uh, they were they said they were able to capture 92% of all deaths in that period of time that they studied it. And they identified three trajectories. Sudden death is not really a trajectory, three trajectories. And we will be discussing them uh, a little further ahead. Uh, this is important <clears throat> because when people talk about it, everybody thinks about it, death like a black box, something that nobody knows anything about. It will happen someday. That is actually not true. Obviously, it is true for one, and that is sudden death. Uh, and sudden death typically uh, affects younger individuals relatively more commonly. Obviously, younger individuals do have much less. But after the age of 50 years, uh, uh, in the original paper, just about 7% of people died suddenly. So these were obviously people above the age of 65. Uh, why is this so? This is because most risky behaviors, be it a terrorist with a gun or a bomb or a, a motorcyclist who I call, uh, um, well, somebody who's preparing to donate his brains, uh, <laughs> donate his organs, or uh, uh, even say somebody who smokes away uh, nonstop well, if they survive past the age of 50 years, it's likely that their risky behaviors will come under control. So after the age of 50 years, less than 10% of people die suddenly. And to die suddenly in your 80s, like our long-haired president, you really require to have had a lot of punya, like he did. The Of the uh, trajectories that we can identify uh, in... Uh, 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 prospectively, the first is that that of cancer. We call it terminal illness, but it also applies to conditions like motor neuron disease and so on. Uh, if you think of it, cancer typically affects uh, the highest uh, numbers are in the 60s. And once the uh, tumor burden uh, crosses a certain point, once the second chemotherapy has failed, uh, then it has a very predictable trajectory and it's called the waterfall trajectory. You can you can be s certain of the point at which uh, 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 the curve will hit the axis. Mm, these are individuals who actually generally start off at a fairly good level of functioning and until they reach this inflection point, their function is maintained. Cancer accounts for about 20 to 20 percent of all deaths, and the numbers are actually dropping. <laughs> Most of you will recognize this picture of uh, Mr. Manohar Parikar uh, shortly before he passed away of uh, CA pancreas. Then, people in their 70s, uh, this is called the looping or the re entry re entry trajectory. Uh, <clears throat> this applies to people who have diabetes, hypertension, whatever, alcoholism, whatever reason it is, they end up with kidney, heart, lung, liver failure. And this accounts for a little you know, under, uh, say, around about 15% of all deaths. And <coughs> um, I usually use the picture of the common man here because VIPs get transplants. So uh, these are people who go into a crisis, come into hospital, crisis, hospital, out. And each time they are not, they come out of hospital a little worse than when they were before the crisis hit. And eventually they pass away during a crisis. Um, nobody identifies this trajectory. And I, uh, in practice, when I'm counseling patients, families, I actually draw this for them and show this is what, this is, what is happening to your uh, mother or father, and then, then they get it. So here, of course, again, uh, their level of functioning uh, is not as good. They've already declined, and it continues to decline. 
but because the next trajectory that people start off at a fairly low level of functioning and they gradually dwindle away down and this is this trajectory is called the dwindling trajectory uh it affects people in their 80s and beyond uh old age obviously is a straightforward cause but otherwise we also term this frailty and dementia <clears throat> and here they the, the the lingering goes on and on and on until finally it touches baseline and uh, as you can imagine this may not be that predictable and the picture here is that of atal bihari vajpayee who had a stroke just after uh, uh, the the uh, uh, his last major election i think that was 2004 and we really didn't hear about him except occasional pictures until he passed away in 2018 but there's a fifth trajectory that has been identified more recently and this is a trajectory that has is an artifact of modern intensive care so you have somebody who's high functioning it could be a young individual a younger individual who's hit by a stroke a clot or an accident bomb whatever and they have a precipitous decline in function in earlier years they would have died but because of modern intensive care they are taken through the period of crisis uh, surprisingly we've been identifying a similar trajectory in healthy elderly individuals these are typically people in their late 70s or 80s who get a systemic illness the classic one is a hip fracture and after the fracture uh, they have a period of delirium and uh, or sepsis or whatever and when they come out of the icu they have declined and typically they even have cognitive decline and so on and this is now termed the fifth trajectory of critical illness right so in all these trajectories can we foresee and foretell death remember that from the time of hippocrates foreseeing and foretelling was accepted as one of our duties but what has happened in today's time our patients have become empowered and uh, we cannot be oracular we have to explain why we have we are uh, prognosticating and because of that uh, because we are expected to be both uh, both honest and accurate but also add optimism we find it difficult to do uh, especially if you are not trained in communication skills and when that happens we tend to avoid this whole business altogether and uh, that leads us to problems that we will talk about later so i guess you have understood by now that most deaths will be anticipated or can be anticipated though a minority are unexpected and that figure seems to be common across the world under 10% now uh, if you recognize this decline then you can anticipate needs plan better uh, may not need to admit patients and people can live and die in a place and manner of their choice uh, one way to do this and probably the standard way is called the gold standards framework which Uh, has applications all across the field of end of life care even though it originated in the uk it's it's something that is used across the world so the gold standards framework begins by asking if we can recognize terminal illness and there are four triggers and i'll be discussing each of them in detail the first is called the surprise question the second is general indicators of decline which means somebody's ability to take care of themselves go down goes down then there are specific clinical indicators related to uh, individual disease conditions and finally is decision <clears throat> when we decide the patient or the family decides that we will now move on to comfort care so the surprise question uh, is applicable to patients with advanced disease or progressive life limiting conditions if a uh, experienced physician answers no to the following question would you be surprised if this patient were to die in the next year or change the time frame would you be surprised if this patient were to die in the next few months weeks days whatever now uh, 
when i said experienced physician it does not really need that much experience also uh, because it is largely an intuitive answer where you put together clinical features comorbidities but also social and other factors so that you get a whole picture of deterioration and obviously uh, the more experience one is the easier it gets if we make a point out of making this estimate and this accuracy is highest in oncology but it is not bad even in non oncology about 70% so that is the surprise question and the surprise question has been statistically validated it's it's it, there's been a fair amount of effort that has gone into it and you'll be well you'll be surprised if you look up the literature on it the next is general indicators of decline here uh, we identify decreasing activity so functional uh, status declines the ability to take care of oneself declines and these are patients who are in bed or chair more than 50% of the day this is in a sense an inflection point but you need to do this systematically so if you need to do it systematically there are various uh, uh, indices that are available uh, the karnofsky uh, performance status score is what is most commonly used in oncology and it gives you a number uh, in dementia we use something called the fast scale uh, together with this declining level of activity there are some other indicators that we need to pay attention to comorbidity is the biggest predictive indicator in advance for instance if somebody has uh, a similar performance uh, you, you take two or three patients with the same performance score the one who has more comorbidities is the one that is likely to deteriorate early because obviously the variables that are involved will be more uh, then obviously advanced disease when uh, complex symptoms are worsening uh, it could be something like breathlessness it could be something like severe constipation and parkinsons uh the response to treatments is declining uh, uh airway obstruction is the reversibility is less diabetes is not well controlled and so on <coughs> so these are the general indicators <coughs> but there are a couple of numbers that you can actually follow progressive weight loss is fairly obvious more than 10% in 6 months but i find serum albumin dropping below 2.5 that is significant and then if somebody comes back into hospital again and again uh, this is uh, identified in heart failure but also in uh, uh, other uh, organ failures if somebody comes into the hospital more than 3 times in 6 months you need to be prepared for the worst and there is something called the sentinel event the sentinel event is an event in the life of a individual which completely changes uh, their outlook to life and their ability to respond to any kind of stresses it could be a medical event a serious fall but it could could also be a psychosocial event for individual diseases and organs you have specific guidelines uh, the most predictable are for cancer uh, uh, somebody who has recurrence uh, and or metastasis after initial therapy uh, basically stage 4 disease with multi morbidities with no further treatment yeah you know that they have now got a terminal illness but if they are spending more than 50% of the time in bed or lying down then with an oncology clear oncology diagnosis prognosis is estimated to be about 3 months or less uh this does is different from other organ systems in 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 oncology this seems to correlate with tumor burden and that is why it is so much more predictable as you would imagine it's erratic and unpredictable for organ failures so you have multiple indicators and you can look at those for heart disease those for copd those for kidney uh, for instance look at those for liver disease so uh, somebody who's 
got hepatic failure but also has a hepatic cellular carcinoma no chance of liver transplant and has complications of cirrhosis this is an individual who's probably already gone through multiple of those entry reentry cycles that we are talking about and uh, you can see that their function their resilience their uh, immune status has probably all dropped and any uh, future admission can carry them out when it comes to neurologic prognosis again pretty complex because uh, each of these uh, disorders has their own <coughs> uh, set of markers and their own uh, progression so uh, in all these conditions what we try and do is identify signposts of decline so you know when somebody uh, crosses a certain point that uh, 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 this is something that the family is also able to identify and uh, uh, we know that this is now an ongoing process of decline i'm not going to go into the details of this except to point out the reference for you it's it's well worth a careful look but there is one more that we spoke about and that is decisional this specifically applies to uh, neurology but also applies to people with frailty multimorbidities organ failure and so on these are people whose physical and cognitive functioning is declining in spite of optimal therapy so it could be somebody with ck2 who's get, getting more and uh, sicker and sicker in spite of the best possible dialysis symptoms which are complex and too difficult to control together with swallowing and speech problems basically bulbar failure is now coming in which is uh, probably for neurology the big uh, last stage before they uh, end up with complete uh, dependence so to explain how this goes i'm going to show you a few cases and uh, these are not this these are not single patients actually i have incorporated uh, two or three stories in each but these are patients that you and i could have seen so the first is this gentleman who actually i saw only at the end but in january 2014 uh he started to become forgetful and a diagnosis of early dementia was made and he was started on medication he was also treated for mild depression uh at this stage he was able to engage and he asked the neurologist what will happen next but there was no meaningful discussion uh he had actually realized that things were not something was going wrong and he had retired from his multiple responsibilities living with his wife reasonably well off uh children settled in the us and you can see the the trajectory of decline 2014 onset 2015 onset meaning uh clinical uh, onset 2015 maintained independent daily routine but uh, started to simplify uh, activities and had this habit of repetitive questioning which was irritating his wife quite a bit by 2016 he started to need supervision with uh basic activities of daily living and now he started to shadow his wife constantly uh this is this is often a response that we see in people with dementia they because of a kind of an insecurity they the they literally don't want to leave the caregiver out of their sight and then behavioral issues started to increase he needed prodding for bath even for clothes change intermittently he would get violent and once he uh, opened the front door and walked out fortunately the big building chokidar got him back in um in 2018 the beginning of 2018 he was admitted with delirium encephalopathy due to urinary tract infection and was found to have a hypo functioning tetrusor probably this had developed over a period of time but given the fact that he had dementia it was quite possible that he had not been able to communicate and he ended up going home with a suprapubic cystostomy and now he needed supervision for uh, all the basic activities of daily living his conversation went down and now it is the wife who asked what will happen next and again no substantial answer was given 
at the end of this year he came into hospital with uh, uh, low sodium but in spite of regular physio and everything after it was corrected he remained mute and obviously now he was uh, completely bedridden in january 2019 he had a bout of generalized seizures and when he came into the casualty he got intubated uh, treated with drugs uh, levetiracetam and phenytoin the seizures came under control immediately a little interesting because both levetiracetam and phenytoin do not produce respiratory depression uh, there was no obvious cause that was detected and even though he was placed on the ventilator uh, he he could be weaned off it fairly quickly and then he got a tracheostomy but the peg happened only after prolonged discussion finally he was discharged for home care uh, almost a month after he was admitted but when he was discharged he was effectively in the persistent vegetative state uh in fact the delay between the tracheostomy and the peg was because the family suddenly kind of started to question why what is happening uh in fact the us based son asked could we have involved palliative care earlier eventually he got home uh remember his wife also is 82 year old hired caregivers and the family physician and our palliative people kind of coordinated for the management but uh, things kept going down uh then about 5 weeks after the uh, admission uh sorry uh, five weeks after discharge he had this episode where he vomited uh, probably aspirated a huge amount stop breathing and he was declared dead at home by the family physician so if you see there were multiple missed opportunities here uh, at diagnosis he could have been asked what he would want to plan for himself because at that stage he was able to do that so we call this advance care plan or at the first admission his family could have been given a clear prognosis that his dementia was now reaching uh, dementia in any case is a terminal illness but it was now reaching uh, the last stages at the second admission when he came in uh, with hyponatremia goals of care would have been discussed uh future hospitalizations could have been avoided and if he did uh he might not even have been admitted for seizures if dni dna are orders in mean place we could have managed him without intubation and the tracheostomy if at all he had been intubated we can we could have done a palliative extubation rather than a tracheostomy uh, not that we would have changed the course of his illness but we would have cut out the last stage of his illness by about 2 to 3 months so this is a patient with dementia let's look at this other gentleman a retired businessman uh again uh, living in mumbai only child in the us and he develops uh a ca colon also a proliferative growth moderately differentiated and he goes from the gastroenterologist to back to his family physician and on to an onco surgeon uh at this stage the left hemicolectomy was performed uh one thing that bothered him was that uh, if anybody else was there given the fact that he had a terminal i mean he had a very severe illness uh people tended to he actually pointed out that people tended to talk past him or talk through him it's not that we talk to the patient and tell them that this is the problem uh, even though he knew what he was going through so he had chemotherapy which he tolerated well except one episode of confusion the thing that happened after this was that his us based grandson managed to get palliative care involved uh, the chemotherapy got completed and then he was on three monthly follow up with the oncologist except when he once he went to the his grandson's graduation in the us in the regular follow up pet ct there was bad news there were extensive metastases in liver and lungs and uh, the expected survival that was 
informed him was about four months. But he was offered palliative chemo with targeted therapy. Uh, and he was told that uh, the best case would be 24 months. I mean, they would increase median survival of another four months. So not surprisingly, he chose the palliative care option. They did a home visit and they set up hospice care at home. And uh, a little later, uh, after this had happened, he had a prolonged discussion with the palliative care team together with his wife, daughter and grandson uh, who participated on Skype. And the grandson now, in fact, had gotten a new job. He asked for and got two months of leave because he said, I will come uh, go there and take care of Nana because everybody knew what was coming. So, you know, family rallies around on that. And he they did all the necessary paperwork. Uh, by May, he had declined to the point that he was uh, completely on bed. And this is when the daughter flew in. And it was almost as though he waited for her to arrive, uh, greeted her, and then the next day he was gone. So these are two conditions that we've discussed, uh, dementia and malignancy. What is the diagnosis of old age? Remember that uh, regardless of what we do, human life expectancy is not expected to increase much beyond 80 years. Um, I'll leave this. So uh, this is about an old lady uh, who, uh, as I called her, retired homemaker, retired housewife, in November 2014, moved to Nasik to live with her uh, older husband because they both needed to live near and be supported by their only daughter. This was because her diabetes was poorly controlled and she had had episodes of hypoglycemia and DK, even though everything else was normal. And the daughter wanted them close where she could manage. So new home uh, supported by servants, which our lady did like, but the daughter insisted. Um, she had a fairly active social life, even after the move. Then in April 2016, uh, little less than two years after the move, she had a febrile diarrheal illness and needed admission, but was discharged quickly. Later that year, she had a fall, a fracture, neck fever, uh, transient post-op de delirium, but then recovered well and eventually went home with uh, home health aid and regular physiotherapy. Uh, she was walking with a walker at three months. A little after this had happened, this was October 2016, March, just about five months later, her husband, um, who was by then, I think, in his touching 90, uh, collapsed after three days of vague chest pain and mild fever, confirmed to be lobar pneumonia, multi-organ failure within 24 hours, and because Mrs. U.P. and he had spoken about this during her previous illnesses, uh, they had really scared the two of them. So they had discussed this and uh, their daughter had also helped in with the discussion. Uh, she signed off a DNAR for her husband and he passed away 48 hours after admission. Uh, they, in fact, wanted the bodies to be donated to the medical college. Anyway. Uh, the usual ceremonies and all that were done. And uh, starting in April, her granddaughter moved in to live with her. And uh, this was obviously her favorite. So she actually said, this is, I'm very happy. But uh, another seven, eight months later, uh, you can imagine uh, yet one more turn. And this was when she developed multiple superficial soft tissue abscesses. Uh, these were treated with IV antibiotics. In fact, twice she got admitted. Um, but eventually it was realized that the abscesses weren't clearing up. Uh, although they would become clean with granulation tissue, uh, they were just not healing completely. And uh, she, she asked, I mean, why is this? What is this happening? And she was told that the medicines are not working. Her decision was very clear. I don't want to go to hospital again. Nothing more was talked about, but this was 
uh, I thought as clear as it could get. And uh, a little later, her activity started to reduce, started to need help with all basic activities of daily living. Um, and uh, intake started to go down. Second week of uh, June 2018. So this was uh, almost three and a half months later. She became confused, a little restless. She would moan even on turning over in bed. Hands and feet became cold and she became a little incontent. And we actually knew that uh, active dying had begun. Three days later, she stopped breathing. Uh, she stopped speaking and she actually stopped breathing the, later the same day. So if you see the differences between the, uh, the first and the third patient versus the second patient. Cancer, defined trajectory, defined prognosis, admissions avoided, and patient and family in full control, especially if there is transparency. Here, even if there's transparency, the trajectory is erratic or prolonged. Uh, there are recurrent admissions at a stage when you don't know what the final prognosis is uh, or the time frame. And uh, uh, in dementia, in addition, there's an early loss of personhood. So you end up with expensive and avoidable ICU care at the very end. Um, this leads me to a question. Is there a difference in oncology and, say, neurology in their approach? So, you see, one thing that happens is that cancer biology makes all the ethical and legal decisions. Whereas in neurologic and non-oncology death, these ethical choices and balancing on legal issues is RB. And uh, uh, as I often say, the medical professional is not very well prepared for it. So, uh, on this yeah so if you are looking at patients who have come in with uh, uh, neurologic illnesses where uh, you're looking at decisional uh, states you can still use a prediction this prediction uh, there are actually multiple scores i find this the uh, most useful uh, this predicts one-year mortality in older adults more than 70 years. It was validated uh, in a U.S. hospital in pa patients admitted for acute illness. Uh, nothing to do with anything, any specific condition, but just generally admitted to a hospital for acute illness. Uh, and at discharge, this kind of information is almost always readily available. So, sex, how many activities of daily living are dependent, uh, whether all are dependent, creatinine, above three, albumin, less than three, congestive heart failure, solitary cancer, metastatic cancer. And if anybody who has zero to one points, their uh, mortality in the subsequent one year is not very different from the general population. But if somebody has more than six points, somebody has more than six points, then the likelihood of mortality in the subsequent one year is over 60%. And if you look at it, uh, if you look at what it is like cumulatively, you will realize that 64% in the first year, uh, by the third year, effectively becomes close to 90%. So I told you earlier that do we have a responsibility to foresee and foretell that? Yes, we do. Uh, the thing is, do we know how to do it? No. Now, as I said earlier, uh, before the middle of the 20th century, diagnosis, therapeutics, and prognosis were all equally important. But uh, as medical treatments improved, the skill of prognosis declined. Prognostication consists of foreseeing and foretelling. And uh, one of my statements is that if you do not commit to foretelling, your foresight will inevitably atrophy. Uh, right. So when you have done this, 
you then get into the content of communication for end of life care and this again splits into three buckets they tend to overlap and you can kind of go from one to the other and back again but you have to understand that these are the three ways in which it works goals of care goals of care well when we look at any kind of treatment uh, we are looking at uh, longevity cure uh, relief of symptoms and so on and sometimes these can be contradictory so you have to explore and elaborate them they are iterative which means it do, it's done over and over again and this is basically patient education the next is goals of care is extended to a system for documenting this information and making it actionable so there are two things that you have to do one is wishes and the second is choose a proxy decision maker for the end of life uh, and finally when somebody is in uh, uh, the last stages shared decision making combines family or patient inputs with clinician input to make appropriate in the moment decisions so when you said goals of care you're basically explaining and communicating and you have to confirm how much they actually understand um typically one of the key things that we ask is where would you want to spend your last hours days or so on and uh, uh, typically most people want it to be at home but you have to confirm the caregiver can manage and remember wishes and plans may change specific end of life decisions i told you earlier about place of care and of death but it's also life saving treatments uh these would include these would include uh cpr invasive ventilation dialysis uh even rice tube and peg are also included and and parenteral medications other than those required for symptom control so iv antibiotics chemotherapy and so on uh can i uh, just a minute huh? okay so uh if it is done well it improves the patient's quality of life decreases burden and conflict and the system is not overburdened with unwanted treatments the challenges are from the patient side the fear of death and the difficulty in talking about it and from the clinician side uh not just a lack of time but also difficulties in discussing prognosis uh this is not done because one families do not see the timeline of decline they are they lay, lay people they don't understand these things clinicians may also not see it but may see it and ignore it and having seen it may not know how to handle it remember that if you do not know how to foretell your foresight will inevitably atrophy and to do this you need communication skills it's a learned skill which means training practice assessment and then performance unfortunately it's not something that uh, many senior people like being told that they need to be trained specifically in uh, communication skills that's me trying to explain to one of my senior colleagues how important the communication skills is so uh, the barriers that people identify the first is is that it is stressful which it is it is stressful nobody likes giving another person bad news and it you you get stressed just thinking about it but it reduces with training it reduces if you use standardized protocols and then your confidence goes up people think it is quite time consuming it is not it uh, the first one the main conversation takes not more than 20 minutes usually and if it is done well it reduces further questioning uh transparency reduces anxiety in fact improves hope uh even if it is uncertain you can identify signposts of decline so that you are prepared uh there is this question about whether if we say i don't know or i don't understand then patients and families uh well uh may kind of stop trusting us that is also not so because they understand that this is possible and if they don't agree we can always recommend and facilitate a, a second opinion um it's not accepting failure it's accepting reality so that we can work with patients and families uh, as 
long and as far as this. Now, I'm going to stop here because the next part of the talk is on active dying and the clinical features around it. I will probably go a little quickly there. So if anybody has any questions, please, uh, for this first part of the talk, please shoot them now and then we'll go on. Uh, anything in the chat box so far? I can see only, can't see much. Hello. Uh, sir, in the chat box, we have not got any questions. But participants, if you have any questions, I think you can unmute and ask directly as of now. Okay, so what I suggest is you start writing your questions down in the chat box as we because then it, it at the end, it's uh, anybody any questions that are in the chat box will get addressed first. Uh, verbal questions will come after that. Anything? No, nobody has raised their hand also. So I'll I'll go on. Right. So let's move on to the the other part of this topic, the medical part of it. How do we know when a person is actively dying? So this is purely clinical, uh, both symptoms as well as signs. So uh, active dying refers to the period preceding death during which time the patient's physiologic functions wane. Uh, are we, we required to prepare the family and caregivers? And ideally, the care should be multidisciplinary. And it actually ends to afterlife also, after death also with bereavement support. Months to weeks before death, and this is most predictable for cancer, months to weeks before death, uh, the patient starts to withdraw physically and psychosocially. We call this pre-active dying. Uh, ambulation decreases, they start to withdraw from family and friends, Old, oral intake decreases, occasional incontinence incontinence may happen and weight loss suddenly starts to become very prominent. So the next is active dying and this is weeks to days before death. This is when delirium starts off, uh, blood pressure, pulse also tends to go down, the patient is more and more drowsy and uh, is now completely confined to bed with uh, either continuous or intermittent incontinence. Um, when death is imminent, it's now deteriorating vital signs. So consciousness goes down, breathing becomes irregular, and uh, the death cycle is because of secretions pooled in the, in the throat. Uh, the pulse becomes weak and cold and clammy uh, extremities. And the face has a yellow, sallow appearance. And the uh, I find clinically the most important marker, the, the gasp, when somebody uses the mandible also in their respiratory effort, that is, uh, for me, pretty ominous. And the goals of care for us are to make the patients, ensure the patient's comfort, make the end of life peaceful and dignified, and make the memory of the dying process as positive as, pos as possible. And uh, you have to then uh, figure out what medications need to be taken. Uh, this is partly also because maintaining oral intake becomes a challenge. Uh, there's diminished appetite, aversion to food, and maybe even inability to swallow. And uh, it's now recognized that feeding tubes do not enhance survival or quality of life at the end. Because tube feeding is associated with agitation, restraints, and then the pressure so start to worsen. While they don't reduce the risk of aspiration on your mother. Um, if at all somebody has to be put on artificial hydration, it has to be done with the patient's best interests of quality of life. Duly considered. Uh, the better replacement for that is what we term careful hand feeding. This is... Uh, the food items that the patient likes uh, are uh, mashed as required. Uh, you can add nutritional supplements and you feed it by hand. And symptoms of thirst can be taken care of by good mouth care and maybe even ice pieces in the uh, mouth. 
uh, families need to understand that the body is shutting down and intake is going down accordingly, not the other way around. A total fluid requirement of about one liter per day uh, can manage most functions. Uh, we avoid IV fluids because of the risk of pulmonary edema. And as I said, uh, hand feeding of its spoon is probably the best. All medicines that are not required for symptom control need to be stopped. And because uh, uh, the important medicines probably will then now need to be given subcutaneously and your plan about how to manage that. Medications that need to be reviewed at this stage and perhaps stopped, uh, antibiotics, aspirin, statins, vitamin supplements, uh, even insulin and antidepressants. Uh, the favorite route for palliative care is subcutaneous and uh, others that we do use once in a while are transdermal, rectal, sublingual and so on. Of the symptoms that we have to tackle, pain is the most common. It is quite varied. If you are not able to assess it verbally, then you use a validated scale like pain AD. Uh, you have to anticipate and treat it effectively with enough opioids and in case the pain becomes very severe then you should be able to titrate it rapidly okay then comes delirium so here the standard three causes are urinary retention constipation and pain and uh, uh, typically people think that the opioids have actually caused the pain but that's not usually true because opioids are introduced a little gradually and uh, uh, you cannot blame them uh, uh, unless there is enough of a duration to it. You have to review medication. Anticholinergics are typical, are known for increasing delirium. <laughs> and then you use non-pharmacologic measures like increasing natural lights, stopping stimulating noise, put familiar objects, protect the patient's sleep and so on. <clears throat> if it is not coming under control, then haloperidol is the treatment of choice, even though there is uh, no definite uh, documented evidence to it, but everybody seems to use it. Benzodiazepines should be avoided uh, because they can actually uh, cause uh, uh, people to get agitated. Uh, breathlessness, there are four principles of managing. The first is correct the correctable. For instance, if there's somebody has a lot of fluid in the pleural cavity, that can be removed. Uh, then air movement on the face improves symptoms. So you can use a fan on the face. And the last is to reduce the perception of dyspnea with morphine or angiolytics. If it is refractory, then you might need to think about palliative sedation. We'll discuss that a little bit. Nausea and vomiting, <clears throat> again, you reverse the reversible. Constipation, hypokalemia, hypocalcemia. The first line drugs here are stronger uh, drugs that you would probably not often use in your practice. So, uh, uh, haloperidol is the one that I use the most, uh, but others can also be used. And uh, in addition, other uh, drugs that you might use are dexamethasone and lorazepam. Uh, some medications now now even available in subliminal and intranasal space. So, what about pooled airway secretions, the death rattle? Uh, in some, it is because the swallowing reflexes are inhibited. In some, they are there because the bronchial secretions cannot be cuffed up and swallowed. And the family needs to understand that this is not causing any distress to the patient. And uh, uh, um, you can, sorry, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, then of course, the best way of handling it is non-pharmacologic. So repositioning, avoiding suctioning, and swiping the secretions from the angle of the mouth. But if you do need to use a pharmacological means, glycopyrrolate, or hyoscine uh, are preferred. Nursing interventions, you require mouth care, pressure sore prevention, 
police catheterization is probably the only intervention that we often perform. And then you monitor them for constipation. And as you prepare for the end, remember that it will be either the, uh, uh, there'll be a stoppage of breathing or the heartbeat will stop. But there are two dramatic events that one has to be prepared for. In all neuro cases, and sometimes even in other illnesses, the seizures occur and they get out of hand. So the first thing is you do not force objects into the mouth because that is a sure shot way of breaking people's teeth. Uh, you avoid oral medication, subcutaneous midazolam or other anti-seizure medications can be used. And typically, if decisions have been made in advance and the patient is being managed Without an ICU transfer, the patient will gradually become unconscious, quiet, and will stop moving. Uh, the second is the blowout hemorrhage. This occurs with oral malignancy where neck arteries get infiltrated. And this, again, has to be discussed in advance because it can be really uh, uh, scary for people to witness. And you collect dark towels, preferably green, apply steady pressure, and sedate the patient quickly with Midazolam. Now, in this context, when you are using sedation, there's a specific term that you will often run to, and that is called palliative sedation. Palliative sedation is when you are uh, giving somebody relief with a proportionate sedative, uh, but targeting only light sleep and comfort. Uh, whereas euthanasia, actually uses disproportionate sedatives to terminate life. In, in palliative sedation, the intent is to provide sleep, the natural process is allowed to continue, and sanctity of life is up, always upheld. So obviously with this sedation at this stage, death may be hastened, it's called the double effect. But this is not active acceleration of death, which is what euthanasia is. Remember that the family may be suffering as much and maybe even more than the patient, and you have to address their various needs. Uh, if you confirm death at home, you have to uh, be sure that uh, you wash your hands, confirm the identity of the uh, 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 person, watch for signs of life, especially breathing, feel for pulse, uh, wait for about three minutes to complete all of this and maybe go on further. And then, uh, uh, exit and document. Uh, after that, the family needs a bereavement visit. Uh, if it was a patient on opioids, you need to collect back unused opi opioids. And the family can be supported by explaining the wave character of grief. It, it increases and then it decreases. And usually the cycles uh, turn around in a few hours. Mm. So, the best way to handle the family is anticipatory guidance so that they know what is expected to happen and they do not panic. More importantly, we have to be available to answer questions. Uh, assure them that symptom control will continue. And then you can address religious concerns, uh, previous wishes and so on. Remember that bereavement is the period during which mourning and grief occurs. Grief is the natural distress experienced. Mourning is the outward experience of that distress. And everybody's grief is different because it's based on culture, religion, nature of loss, relationship to the deceased, and so on. And uh, uh, because of this, we also do recognize types of grief. Now, acute grief is that intense separation, distress, and pain which follows the death or loss of a loved one. And uh, it has it also incorporates an evolving process of adapting to life without the deceased. And this grief decline, declines over a period of several months. Integrated is when uh, you move past acute grief and the sadness uh, and the understanding of the finality and consequences of the loss are assimilated. Complicated is grief that persists for an extended period of time, exceeds uh, social, cultural, religious norms, and uh, the minimum duration tends to vary from uh, 1 to 12 months. So uh, this is obviously more of a uh, research question also.
bereavement uh, support continues for up to a year uh, after the death but typically you know, the important job is to identify the caregivers who are at risk of complicated grief and uh, you need to uh, figure out ways of helping them so again i'm going to stop at this point terminal illness can be identified the focus has to shift to symptom control comfort and quality of life and the active dying phase must be recognized um now beyond this is the legal part of it i'll take about 5 minutes on it but i thought again since we are near finishing the medical part of it maybe we can have a quick question and answer session are there any questions yes sir i'll box? read out for you so okay. the first question was is euthanasia legality in india will come soon or there are any guidelines for euthanasia in india kindly explain sir okay so i'll i'll come to that because that's part of the next section so if you don't have i don't do it then i'll i'll spell it out separately go on okay so the next question is the document regarding who takes the final decision for dnr i think you will take it in the that next that also comes yeah so <laughs> yeah so D, many questions related to dnr and then um, sir can you any medical issue yeah yeah one question is based on the uh, sir can you kindly explain the difference between grief and mourning with an example so mm, grief is is uh, the inward part of it what the individual concern feels mourning is what is displayed outside so if you see uh, in many uh, cultures uh, mourning is ritualized uh, i don't know if you've seen uh, uh, people in the villages at, at least in uh, maharashtra and so on i've seen that that they have this loud screaming and wailing and so on uh, and uh, uh, we don't of course have uh, a situation like say for instance in ireland where in fact they get professional mourners to do this bit <laughs> but uh, mourning is is the outward expression yes then uh, there's another question time of decision when to consider end of life decision it is by dr nagarjuna okay so uh it's not it's not in that sense uh uh sorry i need to caller i need to turn the it's not obviously a specific time when you can do this it it depends on indicators and the condition but uh, for purposes of uh, provision of care this this depends on your medical system for instance the us requires you to uh, it it puts a limit of 6 months on this uh, uh, that is why something like the gold standards framework works much better because it uses indicators and it is somewhat open ended uh you don't really have to define this period unless your medical system insists or insurance insists on it go on so uh, that's it sir i think we can proceed yeah. with the next part and then take up the remaining at the end da so one of the questions that always comes up is uh, why do we in the medical profession shy away from uh, addressing these issues so uh, if you look at even your friends and family they will say that this is because uh, well they'll tell you that you are not like that but all other doctors they work in corporate hospitals and uh, they have incentives to keep the patient which is actually not correct if you look at it logically uh, you will see that uh, putting a patient in the icu and uh, doing whatever procedures are required that peaks by about 3 max 5 days and beyond that a patient staying on the icu makes no economic sense uh the 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 mistrust of corporatization is not something that you can completely address because i have been told that a uh, uh, corporate hospital is one which uh, the poor cannot enter and the rich cannot leave uh, but if you leave that aside if you look at it from our side uh there's a lack of legal clarity a lack of legal clarity in our minds 
partly because there are no clear regulatory requirements. There's no law which says thou shalt do this, thou shalt not on pain off and so on. So it leaves things a little open-ended. And on the other side, we have this complete, absolute, well, uh, unfounded fear of criminal charges in litigation. If you look at litigation in the US, typically, uh, it is the other way around, where uh, people who did not want to be revived end up getting CPR and then get stuck on the ventilator. They call it litigation for wrongful life. From our side, what we lack is uh, 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 clear prognostication. And But I think the biggest challenge for us is that we lack the capacity to handle this. And if you look at the seniors amongst us, they are not even aware that this is something that can be taught, that needs to be learned, uh, whether it is palliative care, end-of-life care, or communication skills. Typically, when you talk to them, they will say, I know everything about it. And actually, they know nothing. Well, uh, this whole story begins somewhere in the 1950s when uh, ICU care started, and people actually started surviving uh, serious illness, and death started to get medicalized. Uh, Medical paternalism started to end because it all came together from the 1970s. Patient autonomy, even uh, uh, consumer rights, all of them. And you'll be, uh, it's a little interesting that the living will was first written up by a human rights lawyer. And in some ways, uh, as it spread across the US, the individual states kind of became competitive about this. So the US became the world's laboratory for this whole thing. On the other side, from the UK, you had the rise and spread of palliative care. And by about the end of the last century, both of these had spread all across the developed world. Uh, remember that if you're looking at ethics, we have the four pillars, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. But there are others. Empathy is there. Compassion is there. Fidelity and integrity are there. From the patient side, it's dignity and honesty. All of these are components of what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's not very easy to apply these in a given patient. So I strongly recommend looking for and reading up this four box model. How do you apply ethics in, in, in clinical practice? For us, the legal framework has to start with the Constitution of India. But we follow what is termed common law, where uh, these decisions are sorted out case by case by judges and lawyers. And we have Supreme Court judgments to go by. But remember that when there is no judgment, no law, uh, in case of a dispute, uh, published professional guidelines will be looked on by judges as appropriate indicators of what a professional should do. And uh, let me tell you that this is adequately covered there. Uh, I have been involved with this process since 2011 because I was part of the uh, uh, medical committee that looked at uh, Aruna Shanbagh's case. And at that time, that Supreme Court bench clearly said that withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment from a person who was incapable of giving consent was not a criminal process. So uh, although they put a fairly complicated procedure, at least it had been decriminalized effectively. But we follow, the main judgment that follows is the one from 2018, and that's the one that we follow. And this actually very clearly states that all adults with the capacity to consent have the right of self-determination and autonomy. A competent person who has come of age has the right to refuse specific treatment, all treatment, alternative treatment, even if it entails a risk of death. You can only treat them in emergency if they it's not practicable to obtain the patient's consent. But where a patient has already made a valid advanced directive, which is free from reasonable doubt, and specifying that he or she does not wish to be treated, then it has to be given effect to. Now, the thing is, this is a constitutional statement. It's only, a, only parliament that puts together a law which says, if you do this, you will pay so much, so much of a fine. Until judges can't prescribe punishment. Right? So when you look at this, they have spelt out the constitutional morality. They have, we have uh, judgments, we don't have laws. And on this side, we have uh, practice guidelines, policies. 
we are somewhere in the zone in between and the guidelines that we have uh, one is the end of life care policy which has come out from the indian society of critical care medicine and the indian association of palliative care together as way back as as 2014 and after the 2018 judgment some documents that were prepared by uh, uh, partly elicit had a hand in that the first that came out was kasturva hospital uh, kmc manipal put together this document for their own uh, uses which is actually regularly in use uh, this was followed by the advanced care uh, 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 the advanced medical directive that is if you look for it is up on the pallium india website which again we put together then both of these came out within a couple of months of each other uh, just before towards the beginning of the pandemic we'd finished work on them fortunately when the pandemic began the first is the dnar document which has been put out the ice by the icmr now again when people see this they say oh it's an icmr document it is not a law narendra modi has not told me to do this which is rubbish if you run into a controversy uh the judge is going to see, say that this is something that you should have been aware of uh because of this and partly with all of this the uh, all india institute uh, actually put together a document for their practice which is similar to blue maple which also had took into account the 2018 judgment and remember since aims delhi is a statutory body you can actually use this document how do we Uh, use it it's actually a three step process the first is to confirm futility and make sure that there is consensus in the treating team on the futility uh, ideally this cannot be a single consultant's judgment or a single doctor's judgment it has to be by uh, a minimum of three physicians uh, on the patients or family side you need to follow what they uh, wish Uh, so obviously if the patient is competent you start with that but if the competent patient has put together their wishes very clearly you follow that and the last is the surrogate decision makers surrogate decision makers you need to confirm the hierarchy and see that they are in consensus when that happens you then document all of this and this has to be signed off appropriately and then finally you have something called the post i mean you have you have to have an audit at the end of it um so people will say why do all this in mumbai we call this magaj mari well you do this because dama lama is actually illegal uh, people think of this as a jugaad substitute for uh, appropriate end of life care uh, but think of it from a patient's point of view this is what they will see um uh, in in a private hospital we want them to pay and get out and uh, i have had this a uh, 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 journalist uh, acquaintance of mine saying that this was what the statement that you read here was what he was told so when we are dealing with these uh, ambiguous situations uh, again if if something has been cleared up in a court of law you are bound by that and uh, uh, very clearly the general principle is that it is the physicians or medical establishment establishments responsibility to transfer the patient safely to an alternate facility or physician who then takes over to the last time you cannot just dump them in an ambulance and let them die there uh, i think this i'll drop and as i told you remember that when we leave them with a dead body and debts it causes major anti medico sentiments i told you earlier that the maximum litigation is about wrongful cpr the only end of life care litigation in india is a hospital which was fined 5 lakhs for keeping a brain dead boy alive on the ventilator uh, unfortunately uh, the advanced directive although it has been validated is not really much in use uh, i strongly recommend that you look at the details of what is up on the website because it's fairly easy to follow there are faqs also there and uh, uh, even though it is it as of now you are supposed to get it signed out by a judicial magistrate first class to make it enforceable remember that if it is properly filled in and if the family stands by it it is valid 
uh, so we advise people to uh, do this by beginnings by speaking to pe people close to themselves choosing surrogates uh, and then see that it is signed in front of two witnesses ideally it should be in, attested by a judicial magistrate first class but it is that is not very easy yet we also suggest that once it is made it should be shown to every doctor because well you'll find out if the doctor will support it the doctor will find out the hospital's policy and you'll know where to get admitted uh, no country has a complete end of life care legislation all democracies do this piecemeal remember no politician wants to do this because they'll be told you have not provided good medical care and you're giving us a death law in india we are in a state of flux we have to be transparent document our decisions and follow systematic guidelines and then we are safe from criminal li liability and frankly anybody who says this is illegal because there is no law that actually is is really rubbish so let me end by showing you this visual remember that we now have the means to keep the body alive indefinitely should we choose to do so uh three nonagenarians in 2018 and then then one last year uh, exemplified this babra and george bush passed away in their own beds they were literally in darbar as they passed away with family dogs friends everybody around them uh, atal bihari vajpayee died on ecmo in the aims icu on ecmo right and lata mangeshkar had those incomparable vocal cords raped with an endotracheal tube twice not once twice so my rule is that if you are an indian vip you are condemned to torture before death i am going to stop at this point take questions and i'll connect so if you can look at your questions quickly i will uh, we'll i'm sure we can take a few minutes extra uh, i will switch on my uh, this from the mobile phone so that you can actually see me and i can see you guys right okay so give me a minute i'm going to uh, uh, connect through the phone and then in the meantime questions yes sir so thank you for such an amazing session so we have few questions uh so uh the first question is is euthanasia legal in india or it will come soon or there are any guidelines for euthanasia in india so uh for one thing um, uh, i presume you mean end of life care uh, we don't like using the term uh, euthanasia uh, the reason is that uh, euthanasia is uh, is not something that uh, you need you can actually use for sentient human beings so we try and separate this into uh, three uh, categories um, if you look at i'm just leaving this one and uh, sorry recording is success Yeah, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, you are audible. So, so uh, the first is let me explain this by a, a short story. So, the first is uh, uh, this, one of my friends had this old Labrador dog, and the family loved the dog. The dog loved the family, and when the dog got old and aged and painful and incontinent it was time to let him go right that is euthanasia it is not something that applies to sentient human beings the second is uh, 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 there's a story of uh, a friend of mine who's who was working as a registrar in an icu in the uk and there's an old gentleman who had a cardiac arrest during his duty and he 
arrested. I mean, he got revived instantly, shocked and immediately, and thrice he had this arrest. And uh, after the third arrest, the gentleman was conscious. He actually asked for my friend who was a registrar on duty. My friend expected to be thanked. The old man held his hand very firmly and said, don't do that to me again. Let me go in peace. So that is situation number two. And situation number three is a, a paper that I read recently where a Dutch man in his early 40s with a genetic diagnosis of autosomal dominant dementia, which was something that had affected many members of his family who had seen them, walks, walked into a Dutch hospital to receive uh, an injection that killed him. That is physician-assisted dying, physician-assisted suicide or medical aid in dying. So these are three separate situations where the word euthanasia is used. Right? So this third situation, if you are talking of that, no, we are in India far from it. If we get through the stage where uh, we all understand death and dying, if we get through the stage where uh, the second scene, where the old man stops the uh, CPR, which we call uh, foregoing or withholding life-sustaining treatments. If we get through that, then perhaps somewhere in the future, we will actually be able to do, we'll actually be able to get to physician-assisted dying of suicide. But I personally think that is at least about two or three decades away. Right? So, remember that when you use the general term euthanasia for all these conditions, it's not, it, it actually confuses the whole issue. Uh, does that answer your question or does that leave me more confused? Hello? Yeah, sir, I think that's clear. Participants, if you have any doubts, then you can ask here. Otherwise, we can take the next question from Dr. Manjri, who has asked the document regarding who takes the final decision for DNR. Is it drawn by a lawyer? Also, who all need to sign it? No, no, no. If you look at uh, the... Uh, uh, if you see my presentation, uh, you will see... Hello, am I audible? Hello. Yes, you're audible. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If you look at my presentation, you can see the document has uh, details. It's ideally it is signed out by. I mean, if the patient is competent, then it is signed out by the patient and the doctor in charge. Uh, if it is the uh, 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 the surrogate, then well, uh, it can be a single surrogate and the doctor in charge, or it can be the uh, you know the three by three that I told you about earlier. Though uh, as long as it is DNR in advance, uh, I think single is also okay. Uh, it is only when you are withdrawing that we recommend that we have uh, the document has multiple people on it. Uh, there is no lawyer in it anywhere. This is these are these are medical decisions. These are ours. The problem is that because we are constantly pushing off this responsibility to lawyers, and lawyers don't understand it, everything gets stuck because of that. Okay, sir. So the next question is: uh, What if the patient in advanced goals of care has agreed to DNR, but the person power of attorney uh, for health decides otherwise along the course or vice versa which one stands legally if the if the person concerned has written it clearly you are supposed to follow their instructions uh, obviously if you say is this a settled position in law i know that this will get complicated because uh, many doctors will find it difficult to stand against a family which says, do this and don't do what he said. But 
ethically and legally the principle in the 2018 judgment is extremely clear uh, okay sir so the next question is is the onset of grief earlier when the end is prolonged and death has been expected for a long time i am not the expert on this this is something that is pretty complex it varies now from individual to individual it depends on the relationship between uh, the two persons concerned because grief obviously is a two way thing uh, but my understanding is that it is worse when it is sudden and uh, uh, when the person is young uh, and so on uh, in in prolonged issues well people anticipate loss so that grief gets spread out over time it's not so intense in such a short period of time uh dr priyanka has asked uh, for a guideline to be admissible in court um, or all major institutional or society guidelines like you told aims delhi admissible what is the criteria for the guideline committee mm. see guidelines are supposed to be generated by representatives from within a professional body by consensus on based on best medical evidence available at that time uh there is no hard fast set rule unless obviously somebody some society makes a guideline which is completely illogical uh it's the it's not that uh, it's only when there is a contest that uh, uh, the judges will look at that and say okay this is what you should have done um other than that they have no role to play in the judicial system the legal system has no role to play in our guidelines they are ours we are the professionals and again and again it comes back to this it is because we are defaulting that the legal system is being dragged into it um uh, then uh, there's one more question from dr nagarjuna i think he is asking about the advanced end of life uh, care communication word yes man sorry i that word advanced end of life communication algorithm i think he means to ask if there is any algorithm with respect to communication um so so uh, if you look through it there are lots of published algorithms i mean the one that i showed was basically for within a hospital to generate a policy it is based on the uh, iscc and iipc guidelines of 2014 the one that i showed but i mean if you look at serious illness conversation there is there are published algorithms um uh, i'm not sure which specific one that you want but you are welcome to drop me a mail and i'll see if i have it in the literature i'll send it across to you thank you sir one more question is regarding um total parental nutrition in end of life care patients ah like whether it is right. helpful yeah no it is not <laughs> very clearly i mean if somebody has begun active dying then there is no sense if they have even in the pre active dying which i showed you earlier uh especially you know you're you're only prolonging the inevitable so uh, classically for me uh, liver side total parental nutrition even if it is uh, uh, cana uh, clinically assisted nutrition and hydration to a rise you or through a peg tube uh, you put it into a patient who has got dementia well they will survive but one year later you will have somebody in the wasted district so uh, it can be done but uh obviously uh it 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 should not be a position that you reach by default because nobody was thinking or nobody was making a decision uh if you are the physician in charge then at least uh you have to have clarity from the family saying no problem this is what we want 
thank you so much sir i think um, in the chat box um, these were the questions uh, we have discussed everything uh, participants we have two more minutes so if you want to ask anything you can just unmute and ask your questions we can take up for two more minutes apart from that i think most of the questions which came in the chat box all were discussed okay any more questions okay yeah, so yeah then we can end up with today's session over to you, you. shri priya before that i would like to thank roop sir for having such You're an welcome. amazing session thank you so much sir thank you bye 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 thank you dr roop for joining us i do understand that you came rushing off from your uh, duty and then you had to log in sorry for that trouble but still no 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 problems <laughs> at least this is better i mean uh, earlier you uh, i had to tell them no, that i 334 is impossible <laughs> by o'clock at least i can manage <laughs> thank you sir thank you so much uh, for enlightening Bye. our participants on the end of life care so um it is I'll going be, to be I'll christmas be. Uh, week uh, coming so wishing everyone a merry christmas and a blessed uh, weekend this is sri priya along with the dr rupisani and dr hashman sohana signing off from the tipseco hub see you in the next session till then everyone take care and enjoy your holidays bye 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 thank you bye bye thank you